Hey everybody, QuestWise here, and we have made it to the year 2020, and with that, as promised, we're going to be diving back into the past. This is going to be the year where I focus a lot in this channel on what I'm calling Back to Basics, where I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about maybe not necessarily games that I have I've played or run, although I'm familiar with a lot of the ones I'm going to talk about. But it's my chance to research and to learn about and to share with you the history of the hobby that we all love and enjoy, right? The, the hobby of role playing. And what I thought I would do today is there are plenty of channels out there who talk about you know, the granddaddy of them all, Dungeons and Dragons, the world's greatest role playing game. And I don't think I could ever scratch the quality of stuff that they're doing, although we're going to talk about D&D at some point. Uh, during the series of stuff, and we're going to be talking about different versions of D&D. But I thought what would be kind of a fun kickoff would be a game that, for the first time in my life, I've actually um, got to work with, got to read over, and uh, I went back to the very beginning, to the very source of this. And this would be Tunnels and Trolls. This would be the game which I understand was the biggest competitor, the first biggest competitor, to Dungeons and Dragons um, ever. Uh, so uh, the the edition that I have, the, the PDF edition, is a reprint from 2013 of the original first edition of Tunnels and Trolls. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do this, I, I highly recommend you going over to Drive Through RPG and checking this out. It is so cool. And I almost want to write a game just to emulate the style of this game now. Because um, it's done on a typewriter. And you can see that. You can see um, some of the typos. You can see some of the, the, the changes, the additions, the stuff. And how this whole thing was created by sitting down and just pouring out your thoughts and, and design and, and, and writing into a typewriter and designing a game. So this original edition uh, was published in 1975. It's written by Ken St. Andre, who uh, is known as the Troll Godfather. Uh, it was published by Flying Buffalo, and it was in a, a way for the author to enjoy a role-playing game that wasn't as dry and as confusing as the original edition of Dungeons and Dragons was. And I can understand this completely. And if you get the the PDF copy, the reprint in 2013, um, uh, Ken St. Andre does write a a forward to the game where he explains the reasons how the game came to be and the reasons why he designed it uh, in such a way. Having looked at the original versions of D&D, I can totally understand where he's coming from. The game was very, the original game, we're talking like the box set that came out, is very confusing, uh, unless you had somebody to actually show you how to play. Uh, it was also super confusing if you had never played Chainmail, because there are tons of references back to the previous game, which was a miniatures-centric uh, uh, game as well, too. So I can understand completely why Ken St. Andre decided to um, try to create something. Because uh, there, there was, you know, this, the idea of storytelling, the idea of role-playing is a very, very powerful one, as, as most of you know. Um, and it draws us into this hobby fairly deeply at times. And so it, it, the idea of trying to find a way to share it with your friends uh, in an accessible way is very, very intriguing. The basis behind this was that he wanted something that was not only accessible, was a little cheaper to, to garner for his friends, but also something that was easier to play in that saying that like, Dungeons & Dragons utilized a set of polyhedral dice. And at the time that this was created, polyhedral dice were a little bit hard to come by. Uh, so unless you had actually bought the uh, a box set of D&D, it was probably near impossible to find a set of polyhedral dice, which today are super common. Uh, you can find them in Target stores now. Uh, and basically everywhere uh, that you look, you can find a set of polyhedral dice for role-playing. But... In those days, it was a little bit harder. Now, the D6, the six-sided die, was much more accessible. Things like, you know, Yahtzee games and Monopoly. And all these had um, already sets of six-sided dice. So, Tunnels and Trolls tries to use just 
six-sided dice in their approach to things. From my understanding, this was the first role-playing game to do that, to use a set of six-sided dice. And it would become much more common as, um, as time went on, although the polyhedral dice set was definitely the king at that time. Uh, magic was different. Uh, you know, anybody who's familiar with Dungeons and Dragons knows that uh, the magic system is based on, it's called the Vancean system of magic. It's based on Jack Vance's Dying Earth, in which he, um, the author Jack Vance, had described magic as being um, a set of uh, esoteric words and phrases and symbols that you had to press into your mind, and you could only hold so many in your mind at a time. And <clears throat> by casting the spell, after having memorized it, it would vanish from your mind and you would have to re-memorize that. That's something that stuck around through many iterations of Dungeons & Dragons, through many of the OSR retro clones and stuff as well, too. And I've come to really re-appreciate the Vancean system of magic via different sets of, of OSR rules and retro clones and stuff as well. But there was a time that I understood this is, you know, it gets a little boring over time, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. I don't want to say boring, but it becomes very repetitive, I guess, over time. But what's interesting is that uh, Ken St. Andre in Tunnels and Trolls decided to go with a point by magic system. And that I think, again, um, from my research and my understanding, that this was the first time that this was established and an idea of buying magic by spending magical points in order to cast certain things. The spells cost a certain number of points that you accrued by your character classes and such. The game is meant to be a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, Tunnels and Trolls tends to be a little bit... And, and you'll see if you get the 2013 reprint edition, that um, and, and, and the author states this specifically, that the game should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, it can be a little campy at times, especially in the magic system, uh, looking at the names of the spells, uh, they're very sort of jokingly described. They're not as sort of serious as some of the spells from D&D, right? Um, while, while they emulate a lot of those spells, they tend to have a little bit of campier, funnier, punny type, type names, um, which is fine if that's the kind of thing you're going to go for. Um, I think, for me, it was a little bit too lighthearted, uh, and if I were to run the game, which I plan to do, because I'd really like to explore Tunnels and Trolls some more. And by the way, Tunnels and Trolls, the latest edition, the deluxe edition, I believe it was called, was published in 2015. So not very long ago. It's still out there, still available. Uh, and you can find the previous editions on DriveThruRPG as well, too, if you're, if you're interested in some of the earlier editions. But it is a game that really garnered a lot of... Uh, sort of, uh, I don't want to say a cult following, but it, 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 the fans of the groups that I've joined since discovering it, and since starting to study it, are very passionate fans. And they are very hardcore about their sort of fanaticism towards Tunnels and Trolls, as opposed to other role-playing games. And I think that's great. It's really good to see a game like this that's survived over time because of its fan support. And that's the thing that really impressed me about it the most as well, too. The thing that's really interesting about Tunnels and Trolls is that it is more accessible to an alternate form of D&D in that it can be played as a group like a normal session of role-playing games can be. It was designed to also be played via mail, play-by-mail. Now, more modern viewers might be uh, familiar with play by post or play by text. Um, but, you know, when this was created in 1975, there wasn't really a big access to Internet at all. Like there was just not that was not an option. Um, so there were these things. And I remember reading these in some old versions of, of Dragon Magazine as well, too. Where you could play by mail. You would write out your things. You would get a, you know, a scripted newsletter and it would give you instructions on what you do. You would place your replies and mail them back to the other players. Um, and you would play out a role-playing game via the mail, by snail mail, right? Not email, not text messages, not, um, you know, not, not a, a message board. Um, so, you know, not a Discord channel, those kinds of things. Uh, so it was an interesting time period. But it was also designed to play solo as well, too. There were a lot of solo adventures that came out 
that allowed you to play by yourself if you didn't have a group or if you had a group and you just wanted to do things. Uh, that's something else we're going to explore on this channel a little bit as well this year too is solo role playing because it's a it's an interesting topic that's really got me intrigued about playing role playing games as a solo option. And I think that's why Tunnels and Trolls was very important uh, in the history, the grand history of the scheme of role playing. Not only was it the first sort of big rival to D and D. But it also was one of those games that allowed you to experience the role-playing hobby via different methods of play. And I think that that's why it's. Uh, I wanted to kind of discuss it today and share it with you today if you haven't experienced Tunnels and Trolls before. Because it's such, I think, a very important part of the role-playing factor of history over time. is because it gave you alternate methods to play a game. Uh, uh, that people enjoy storytelling and role-playing aspects of those things. So Tunnels and Trolls is our first foray into Back to Basics. Next week we'll cover an entirely different subject, but if you get a chance, I'll put a link down below uh, for this version, which again is a reprint of the original first edition of Tunnels and Trolls. I highly recommend you go check it out. It's only a couple of dollars for the PDF. Um, definitely a fun read, and like I said, it's very interesting. If you are a game designer at all, or if you've ever wanted to emulate, you know, to try your hand at, at game design. Uh, I think this is a fun way to look at a, a game design of something that was completely created on a typewriter. Um, and uh, the aspect of, like, I, I really want to, as a game designer, I want to try to emulate that as well, too. I wanted to put out a small... Uh, role-playing game that's sort of done in that sort of style as well too so until next time i'm questwise i hope you've enjoyed this if you have hit the like button down below i am out hey there fellow questing knights if you're looking to collect vintage rpgs or would like to start and you don't know where to go or if you're looking for a supplement to fill in that hole in your collection i highly recommend wayne's books yeah, that's right wayne's books since 2002 have sold thousands of vintage RPGs. I highly recommend them. I've used them in the past and I have nothing but a hundred percent satisfaction with their service. So if you get a chance, swing on over to Wayne's books and pick up everything you'll need vintage RPG wise. I'm Questwise and until next time I am out.